Hello everyone, this is Bob Brown with Community Code Update number 119. I'm recording this because I've been getting a lot of questions on the Cochrane Mass, Mass Study lately and what it really did and did not say, as well as uh, some stuff lately about the COVID origin debate and how important that really is. So the first article that got forwarded to me was this one from the UK Daily Mail, uh, and I think you have to be careful about reading some of these articles. So uh, my question is this misinformation, meaning the reporter got it wrong, or is it disinformation that they were deliberately uh, putting in bad information out there? Uh, one red flag about articles like this, you'll notice the big continue button right there. This uh, might tip you off that this is a clickbait website, so maybe they didn't do the best job looking at it. Uh, but various headlines claiming that masks either didn't work or that they weren't that effective. Uh, however, it's, I think, pretty clear to me that this reporter either A, didn't really understand the Cochrane study, or B, was deliberately getting some of the things wrong. Uh, it's hard for me to know whether it's an error of omission or commission. If you actually go to the Cochrane Library, and the Cochrane studies are very good. They are they literally are the gold standard for a lot of health care interventions. Uh, however, there's some caveats. Number one is they only look at randomized controlled trials, so they don't look at the other types of trials, some of which are more than adequate to make a decision. So that's a very narrow scope that Cochrane collaborators work with. And the Cochrane folks know that their stuff gets misinterpreted sometimes, so they actually put a plain language summary, which I've highlighted here, in which they say, we are uncertain whether wearing masks or respirators helps to slow the spread of respiratory viruses. So Basically, this was an inconclusive study. It didn't say that masks didn't work. It said they really couldn't say because the randomized controlled trials are pretty limited, basically. So, you know, another way of saying this, if they were, if a Cochrane study, for example, was to look at parachutes when jumping out of airplanes, airplanes, the conclusion would be we are uncertain whether parachutes prevent deaths when jumping out of airplanes based on the randomized controlled studies available, because there aren't any randomized controlled studies available. We haven't done randomized controlled trials on parachutes, nor should we, because the evidence is good enough with observational. When people fall out of airplanes without an airplane, without a parachute, they kind of tend to die. And when they have a parachute, they're more likely to live, assuming they do everything correctly, meaning strap it on, pull the cord, and don't put, steer themselves into an oncoming train or power lines, for example. And so the same thing can kind of apply with mass. The problem is there just aren't that many randomized controlled styles available. And within the article, they talk about the weaknesses that there's just pretty much not enough evidence to conclude, really. Um, you know, kind of like the parachute, just because you have a, a parachute doesn't necessarily it's going to work if you don't do it right. The same thing's true of mass, what they talk, which they talk about in the study, that A, you have to have the right kind of mass. B, you need to put it on correctly. And here's a, you know, some famous nose commandos uh, down in the right lower corner. You have to put the right kind of mask on, say like a KF94 or an N95, and you have to close the nose pinch because if there's a big gap there, it's also not going to work either. And so because the studies didn't go into a lot of that, that's one of the reasons why they judged that this was inconclusive. Uh, the Daily Mail article also did go on and say, actually, surprisingly, even though the headlines often said ma the, the, the article said that masks don't work, in this article, he actually said they found that wearing a mask did reduce illness by 30%, which actually isn't all, all quite correct. So even though here it is saying that masks work, there's a little uh, caveat there where that isn't quite what the study said either. And so they did this infographic saying 5% surgical mass and 30% N95 mass. Um, that's actually not quite what the study said. So, for example, uh, when they looked at the surgical mass, you'll see that the risk ratio uh, over here is 0.95. That's a 5% reduction. But what, what's also important to notice is the confidence intervals across one, which means the study is inconclusive, really. It doesn't say that it's 5%. It could be 5%, but it could be 15%. And when you start having wide confidence intervals that cross the line, it tells you the studies just aren't big enough, and that's probably the main issue, or they weren't well-controlled or other things are confounding things. Uh, and then on the N95, the 30%, that art letter of risk reduction of 0.7, that also still crosses the one. So again, the studies aren't adequate to make this decision. However, that does not mean we're done. So I wouldn't, uh, I would, you know, they did say a 5 and 30% reduction, and even that's not insignificant. I think people are also mistaking that. Uh, so Dr. Caitlin Jettelina did do an article about this as well, so I'd encourage you to look to this. She lists, learns to all, list links to many other types of studies, some of which I'll show her in a second, uh, because randomized controlled trials are not our only source of information. When we don't have those, we can turn to natural experiments and, and observational trials, which are often adequate to make a good decision. We have plenty of those, actually. Uh, so one thing she points out is even a 30% reduction or a 15% reduction in this case can make a difference. Uh, one of our frequent flyers at the school board did point out that, yes, eventually you you'd almost reach the same peak, but part of the reasons for masks is a delaying action so that you have time to prepare. So, for example, prepare your hospitals, uh, get vaccines uh, given to people, for example, uh, and also the delaying uh, prevents your hospital from being overwhelmed. And so those are also important caveats that people have to think about. It's not just the 15% reduction or 30 or whatever it is from the mask. There's other things, uh, variables at play that people have to think about.
uh, like all many things in, pu in public health, it's layers of Swiss cheese, and you should rarely focus on one just one layer. And so masks are just one of multiple layers. So a 5% reduction here, 30% there, 10% there, when you start adding them does make a significant difference. And that's basically what we did at Lincoln Public Schools, for example. We did contact tracing and quarantine to keep infected people out of the school, so that limited, decreased the amount of spread. We had masks for source control, which is one of the two ways that a mask works. It's not just for personal protection. When someone is infected, it decreases the amount of virus they are spewing out into the general air. Uh, we also sometimes can decrease crowding, which we did in our high schools. Our high schools at the time were over capacity, and so we went to half time or half the kids in two days a week and half three, so there weren't as many potential people getting infected. We also increased ventilation, so three air changes an hour made a difference. And then, of course, the mask for personal protection. So these were layers that added together did make a difference. It's not just one layer. Uh, so a couple examples. Here was a study in Brazil. Uh, Brazil, they did it. They had lots of natural experiments to go for them. Why? Why? Because COVID, just like us, Brazil had no cohesive plan from the federal level. So every region did its own plan essentially. And by following what each region did or did not do, they could follow the rates of spread and see which uh, things were effective. In this study, controlling for other things, they found that together, suspension of public health events and full masking, when combined, were enough to reduce both cases and deaths spread to almost one. So again, a multi-layered approach. Uh, another good example was this study out of Massachusetts when the state of Massachusetts rescinded its school uh, requirements for masks every school got to rescind its requirement at different times and they were able to follow in those communities which uh, communities had more spread than the others based on when they re got rid of their masking requirements. And what they found was about a 30% increase when mask requirements were removed from the school. And 30% is pretty significant, especially when you start adding that to other interventions. So here we have yet another study. So there are plenty of natural experiment and observational trials, even though the Cochrane Collaborative, which yes, is the gold standard, only looks at, uh, at randomized controlled trials. We don't have to only rely on those types of studies. Uh, and I think it's going to be really hard for us to ever have randomized controlled trials in a school setting. Uh, to do that, you would actually literally have to get uh, uh, approval from every parent for every kid in every school that you're going to do this type of intervention, then randomize, and that would be just really logistical hard, hard to do. Um, at the end of the day, we even have our own natural experiments across the entire United States. We had such a wide variation of death rate because of what everybody did. Uh, Nebraska was kind of in the middle, but it wasn't because of what the state of Nebraska did. It was because of what certain localities did within Nebraska. Uh, so if you look at the mortality rate by region of Nebraska, Lincoln, which had the most comprehensive and organized approach, had the lowest mortality rate under 150 per 100,000, whereas the non-Omaha and Lincoln areas of western Nebraska, which had much less interventions, had almost double the mortality rate we did. Omaha, which was able to do some partial things, but not to the degree we did, was a little bit in between. And then, of course, you look at the neighboring states, uh, all of whom didn't do near as well as we did, mainly because uh, some of us did much better than others. Uh, if you want to look at it, you know, graphically, here's another way to look at it. But basically, our mortality in Lincoln was a, was a third of that in Arizona. If Lincoln was a state, we'd have had the third best uh, mortality rate in the country, uh, just barely behind Vermont and ahead of Utah. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind still, vaccinations are very, very important. So uh, Lincoln, Lancaster County, it does have the highest bivalent booster rate. 60% of our 65 plus uh, people have had their, uh, their booster vaccine, and it's showing up still in our hospitalizations. So Brian still does put on its dashboard. And yes, we still have people in the hospital, not near as many as we did. But of the 23 people in the hospital at Brian yesterday, three of them are up to date, the rest of them are not. And so again, if we had more people getting the bivalent boosters, we'd have less people in the hospital. This is also generating healthcare costs. Uh, these are all avoidable or mostly avoidable anyway. So COVID update, the short version, get up to date on your vaccinations, the COVID, are, COVID bivalent, uh, get a flu shot. We may even have RSV next year. If you get COVID, start on Paxlovid or an alternative within the first three days. This is the other reason why the mortality rate is higher in rural areas than in Lincoln, because people aren't using Paxlovid to the same degree. I even know that some communities you can't even get Paxlovid, unfortunately. Uh, and so that's actually continuing to add to the mortality. And if you're high risk, you may want to wear a mask in community settings. I don't wear that one right now because I don't think it's needed and because I've had my bivalent booster. Uh, you know, I, hopefully we won't have COVID being the third leading cause of death. It was the, COVID was the third leading cause of death for the year 2020 because of the Wuhan strain, the summer, and then the alpha strain. It was the third leading cause of death in 2021 with the Delta strain and the 
beginning of the Omicron strain, and it was also the third leading cause of death in 2022. The tail end of the Omicron stage strain and all the Omicron subvariants are still causing deaths more than a typical flu year. This back here, this is a bad flu year. Look at that in comparison, even to the late latest COVID numbers. And basically, this was XBB 1.5, which is yet another variant, and the reinfections are still able to kill people. So as of today, this is New York Times, we're still having about 445 deaths a day. If we annualize that number, we're still losing as many people to, for COVID as a bad flu year, car wrecks, and gun violence combined. And so we do need to keep focusing on getting people vaccinated. I wish it was all over. It's over for most of us. I mean, for example, if I'm a relatively fit person, which I am, and I've got a bilateral booster, I don't think there's all that much to worry about. Um, and here's another way to look at things, life expectancy versus healthcare costs that I'm working on another project. Uh, look at the reduction uh, in, more t in, in life expectancy in the United States from la just the last two years of COVID. It's going to drop even further because of 2022. Let's not hear that keep dropping. Other countries had the initial drop, but because they vaccinated better, they're already rebounding in their life expectancies. We aren't. Uh, and again, uh, it's something that should unfortunately have been avoidable. So the last thing lately is the COVID-19 origin debate. And uh, this kind of frustrates a lot of us that it's as contentious as it is. We really don't know for sure whether this was a spillover event or whether it leaped out of a lab. Uh, it really could have been either. Um, one is probably, I think it's more likely that it was a spillover event. But yes, I do agree it could have leaked out of a lab. Um, the question is, so what, I guess, in some way. Um, if you want to read the full story, uh, this uh, the book Breathless by David Quammen really goes through the whole debate and of how this this uh, probably may or may not have spread. Uh, there's a lot of good arguments on both sides of this, and so I think you know honestly it could have been either way. Uh, keep in mind that the Department of Energy said it, they had low confidence in their assertion that it leaked for a lab. They think it was more likely than not, but again it might be like 60-40. And at the end of the day, I don't. I yeah, it's. I think it is imp important to know some some point. I don't think we're ever going to know for sure. To be quite honest with you, I think really we should be putting most of our time and effort into figuring out what do we do next time. COVID was a dress rehearsal. COVID-19 had an overall mortality rate of 0.1 to 0.5 per thousand, depending where you live in the United States, and led to over a million deaths. What happens if the next COVID or flu pandemic has a mortality rate of 10 to 30? And this could happen. The other SARS, uh, the original SARS, the MERS, some of these other uh, infections have had mortality rates up in that 10 to 30 range. It could be 10 to 20 times as bad. Do we, are we prepared? And the answer is we're not. So what I really hope we have next is less of this partisan debate and bickering. We need a nonpartisan independent plan to make this better next time. So again, uh, hopefully this is helpful to you. This is what I do in my day jobs, but these are my opinions, not necessarily those uh, of the organizations. Again, a lot of these links are in the notes section if you want to do further reading yourself.